Hello everyone and welcome to day 26 of Utober and the last and final Utober themed coffee talk of the month. With it being only a few days away from Halloween, we could sit down with some caffeinated warm beverages and get really into that cozy Halloween mood. I didn't know if I wanted to talk about ghost stories or if I wanted to talk about like witchcraft or if I wanted to talk about, I don't know, like zombies or whatever. And I get really intrigued about the origin of things. Like where did this begin? And it got me thinking like, when did Halloween even begin? What is the history of Halloween? And why do we associate things like witches and ghosts and like the devil and like everything that we basically associate Halloween with, why do we do that? So I wanna jump into some Halloween folklore today. We're going to get super into the whole Halloween vibes. And by the end of this, you'll know a lot more about Halloween that you can maybe take into your Halloween weekend with you. Some fun facts to tell other people, I guess. Is handing out candy even going to be a thing this year? That's a sad thought to think about. We're just going to get all up in the Halloween vibe today. What even is Halloween? Why do we even, where did it come from? So Halloween's origins actually date all the way back to the Celtic era. The Celtics who lived roughly 2,000 years ago, mainly in the areas of what is now like Ireland, Great Britain, Northern France, they all celebrated their new year on November 1st. So they marked this day as the end of summer harvest. So it was highly associated with basically entering cold and dark times like winter. And it was also highly associated with death because back in the day, winters were really harsh and difficult to survive through. It then became believed that on this day, October 31st leading into November 1st, that the veils between the living and the dead would basically kind of fall or evaporate, if you will. And so people would have giant bonfires and they would dress up in all different types of symbolic characters to basically ward off the ghosts. Then in the 8th century, Pope Gregory III declared November 1st as All Saints Day. When this happened, All Saints Day started to incorporate some of the traditions of the ancient Celtic festival of Samhain. The evening before All Saints Day started to become known as Hallow's Eve, which I mean, you can see how then later turned into Halloween. So by 43 AD, the Roman Empire had basically infiltrated and taken over a lot of the old Celtic territory. In the course of about 400 years, the Roman Empire ended up ruling most of the Celtic lands and two of their Roman traditions ended up almost kind of, I guess like conjoining with that Samhain tradition or the Samhain festival. The first tradition or event or celebrated thing that got fused into the mix was one of the days earlier on in October where the Romans traditionally celebrated the passing of the dead. The second day was a day that was dedicated to honoring Pomona. Pomona was a Roman goddess that was known to be the ruler of fruits and trees. This is why it is said that back in the day it was a tradition to go apple bobbing. Like you know when they put apples in a barrel and you dunk your head and you're trying to bite into the apples? The origins of that and why it's tied into things like Halloween specifically apples and all of that isn't just because of the seasonal aspect of apples it's actually because it was part of the tradition of this Roman day of celebrating Pomona. Now the celebration of Halloween became very limited in colonial New England instead though Halloween made its way overseas and started to become popular in places like Maryland and a couple other of the southern colonies and with that a very Americanized version of Halloween began. Now this is when we start to see the tradition of parties that were held to celebrate the harvest of autumn. All these neighbors would get together and basically tell stories of the dead and try and tell each other's fortune and sing and dance and celebrate. Now in the second half of the 19th century, America became flooded with a bunch of new immigrants, many of which were fleeing the Irish potato famine. So when they all came over, they started to nationalize what is widely known and celebrated now as Halloween. And this helped to popularize the celebration of Halloween more nationally. And since to this day it has now evolved into what we know as Halloween with yes tales of folklore but also celebrating by dressing up and trick-or-treating or Halloween parties and scary movies and all of the best vibes ever. Now through things like costumes and all of these kind of more folklore traditions and legends and stories things like witches and ghosts and goblins 
brands and so many different things started to become fused or I guess you might say even branded under the whole idea of what fit into Halloween. That said though, a lot of these mythical beings that we just casually toss in or maybe put on costumes for around Halloween, they actually have a lot more dark and twisted storylines within our actual human history and I love researching this stuff and finding out like what where did witches even come to be what was the first noted witch which is actually long before I would have ever thought or things like vampires like who was the first vampire where did that whole myth even begin like are there actual vampires out there and the answer just not to ruin today's coffee talk because we're gonna get there but the answer is actually yes there's a lot of really cool information when you start to dig into a lot of the mythical creatures specifically within the traditions of things like Halloween. And first and foremost, I feel like we gotta start with witches because they're always one of the first things I think of when I think of Halloween, what is now known as like traditional Wicca, which is actually a recognized religion in both the United States and in Canada. But I've read some books about witches and witchcraft and I find witches and witchcraft so interesting. Now, I think most of us have heard of things like the Salem witch trials and a, a little pieces here and there of witch history based on what movies you may have seen or shows you may have seen but I collected some of the information so that we can really take a, a really quick and easy really it's not I was gonna say a deep dive but it's not gonna be a deep dive but we're gonna take a coffee to go version of witch history so first and foremost witches were basically labeled by Christians as being evil creatures as being involved or in cahoots, if you will, with the devil, which is why they kind of got swept into this whole Halloween vibe, you know, because Halloween has all of that like darkness and death and all of that surrounding it. So that's where the tie began with Halloween and witches, but witchcraft and witchery and witches in general have been around for long before Halloween actually ever existed. It's interesting when you start looking at the different variations of witches that you see, you know, from you look at like witches in Disney movies where they have like a big wart on their nose and like they like cackle and they fly on brooms to more of like the modern age witch, which uses a lot of herbal medicine or is just kind of like a natural healer. So the earlier witches were known for celebrating and using things like witchcraft, where they basically called upon spirits to help them through times or tried to basically use spiritual energy and holistic medicine in some cases in order to bring about whatever wish or change someone may be looking for. They would use things like magic spells, they would use things like riddles and potions, but most witches were thought to be pagans doing the devil's work. What the actual truth was is that a lot of them are really just healers and like I said using things like holistic medicine, using things like and what we call now kind of like manifestation or prayer or it's, it's actually much like prayer when you get into witchery and witchcraft and you look at I guess a lot of the practices it's just a different form of prayer. I feel like it's been so watered down in things like movies but these were really just very wise intuitive spiritual women and also sometimes men. Now it's unclear when witches actually first historically came on to the scene, but one of the earliest records of a witch is in the Bible, actually. It's back in Samuel 1, which was thought to be written around 931 BC and 721 BC, so witches have definitely been in human history for a very long time. That said, the whole witch conundrum and I guess like popularity of witches didn't really take hold until Europe in about the 1400s. Now this is when many women or and also like I said there were also men were accused of doing or using things like witchcraft and doing the devil's work and a lot of them confessed after being tortured brutally of a lot of like wicked and twisted behaviors that were really just misunderstandings of what witchcraft is. Now within a century of that time, witch hunts started to become popular, people started to become convicted of crimes, and many witches were executed by burning or hanging. And unfortunately, this is actually really, really sad, but single women, widowed women, and women who lived more on the outside or the outskirts of society were more specifically targeted. So in between the years year of 1500 and 1660, it is suspected that nearly 80,000 people were put to death solely for being labeled a witch. And roughly 80% of that 80,000 were women that were said to be 
involved or doing the devil's work. Now in 1486 there was a book that became highly popular that was released. Its translated title is called The Hammer of Witches and it was basically a guide on how to identify and be able to pick out a witch or to catch a witch. It basically labeled witchcraft as a hoax and it became kind of like the backbone that a lot of Protestants and Catholics used to attack people that would practice witchcraft. Now this fact I thought was really cool. For more than a hundred years, this book sold more than any other copies of any other books in Europe, including the Bible. So that just goes to show you how widespread this entire myth about witchcraft and Wiccans came to be. And this is basically what continued and led into things like the Salem trials and so on and so forth. Now, modern day witches still exist. Like I said, I, have, I actually have read a couple books on witchcraft and witchery and they're written by women that call themselves witches. The most practiced form of witchcraft is known as Wicca, and Wiccans actually believe in the opposite of evil. Wiccans are known to avoid evil and the appearance of evil at all costs. And a lot of the spells and the work that they do is very similar, like I said, to kind of like working with prayer or, or working with like your higher self or your spirit. It's just like another translation of the same thing. The motto of Wiccans is harm none. And the goal within Wiccan practice is basically to live in harmony with yourself and with nature. And to this day, people still perform magic spells. They still create a lot of herbal remedies, a lot of holistic medicine, like I said, and a lot of this still exists in today's world and is still known as witchcraft. So we all know how important comfort is in this neck of the podcast woods, whether it's, you know, your favorite comfortable sweater for running errands in or your favorite yoga leggings to do yoga or run errands in, but what about the comfort of your feet? The PEDS All Day Active No-Show Socks are made to bring comfort wherever you go. With arch compression, breathable mesh, a comfortable toe seam, and foot forming fit, the socks provide quality and support at an affordable price. Plus, there's double tabs on the socks that provide an additional layer between the pressure points of your foot and the shoes you're wearing, which is super cool. So now that fall and winter season is back upon us, I find myself wearing socks more regularly, but the thing is I'm super picky about socks. For one, I don't like when my socks show above my shoes, and two, Two, I have this weird thing with like the comfort of my feet. I feel like I need to be able to move my feet around to feel comfortable, but to also wear something that is, I guess, like lifestyle friendly. So you can wear them while doing yoga, but you can also wear them if you're just walking your dog or running errands or even just like hanging out on the couch watching a movie. You know, you can wear them throughout all the different phases of your lifestyle. Just a few of the benefits of these PEDS all day active no show socks is that they're not just comfortable, but they're good quality. They're durable, they're stylish, and like I said, they don't show above your shoes. But all of that comes at an affordable cost, which is huge. Not to mention they're knit responsibly with Reprieve, which products featuring Reprieve contain at least 13% recycled materials to lessen the impact of raw material production. So as you're going through your day to day, whether it's waking up in the morning and instantly wanting to just put something warm and cozy on your body and your feet, to doing your yoga, to running your errands, or if you're like me and as soon as the cooler seasons come, you like to lotion up your feet and put some socks on to keep them just fresh and comfortable and most importantly warm, then definitely check out the PEDS All Day Active No-Show Socks. You can get them at peds.com or they're available at other retailers such as Target or Amazon. This Coffee Talk episode is brought to you by Public Goods, the one-stop shop for affordable, sustainable, healthy household products from home to personal care to premium pantry staples, all in one easy-to-go place. So rather than buying from a bunch of different single product brands, Public Goods members can buy all their premium essentials in one place with one beautiful, streamlined aesthetic. The cool thing about Public Goods is that they search the globe to find clean, eco-friendly, innovative, and healthy products like sulfate-free shampoos or hand sanitizers, tree-free paper products, pet foods, and so much more. And then they bring them all in one place where you can get those 
those items, knowing that you're, you know, spending your dollar on good things that are not only good for the environment, but they're good for you too. With everything ethically sourced and obsessively developing each of their products to be free of unhealthy ingredients and harmful additives that are still common on drug and grocery store shelves, they are committed to making their products healthy and safe for humans and animals and the environment, which is so important. One of the things that I've been really like nerdy about recently is like just I guess the types of food I feed Bentley. I started dipping really far into the different products that go into made dog food. I think because I'm like that with the food I eat, like I try to eat organic and, and things like that. So I got really curious about what was in my dog's food and it kind of blew my mind. So I loved that going on to public goods, it has a wide variety of dog foods to choose from, but I know and I feel comfortable and I trust that I'm getting good, high quality, premium dog food for my dog that has the best ingredients. Knowing what's in your products, whether it is your dog food or products that you're using like shampoos and so on and so forth, it's important to know where they come from. Small changes in the ways that we shop can make a huge impact on personal health and the world at large. Public Goods uses a membership model to keep costs low and to pass on even more safety savings to customers. But best of all, you can make your first purchase with no obligation. They plant one tree for every order placed, and they've planted over 140,000 trees just since September of 2019. So they offered an exclusive deal just for all the Coffee Talk listeners. You're going to be able to get $15 off your first public goods order with no minimum purchase. They're so confident that you will absolutely love their products and come back again and again that they're giving $15 for you to spend on that first purchase. You have nothing to lose, just go to publicgoods.com slash K-A-L-Y-N, or you can just use the code, my name, Kaylin, at checkout. That is P-U-B-L-I-C-G-O-O-D-S dot com forward slash K-A-L-Y-N to receive $15 off your first order. These days, it kind of seems like people are putting CBD in everything, right? And we've talked about CBD a few times, but there's a lot of noise out there. There's one company though from Vermont that's actually worth all of the hype and that's Sunsoil. So Sunsoil is USDA organic CBD oil that's made from hemp plants. How the hemp is grown really matters. Sunsoil farms their hemp in Vermont and they never use pesticides, herbicides, or GMOs. Now I try to be mindful of the products and the ingredients within those products that I'm specifically putting on or in my body and that's why I love that Sunsoil is made from simple ingredients that I can pronounce. Many of their products contain coconut oil and hemp and that's it. Because Sunsoil farms their hemp and makes their CBD oil in-house, their prices are less than half the price of other brands so you can get organic CBD at an unbeatable price. With clear labels on the amount of CBD that's in each serving and the fact that Sunsoil also tests every batch of product at three independent labs and then publishes the results on their website, their brand feels more transparent. Not to mention they're also giving back by donating a percentage of sales via the 1% for the planet to environmental and community causes. Sunsoil makes CBD oil with simple organic ingredients. So if you want to get 30% off your first order, just head to sunsoil.com slash K-A-L-Y-N. That's S-U-N-S-O-I-L dot com slash K-A-L-Y-N for 30% off your first order. Again, that's sunsoil.com slash Kaylin. Now, I can't think about Halloween without thinking about vampires. So, of course, I thought it'd be really fun and cool to find out a little bit more about the history of vampires. So a vampire is basically a mythological creature that is said to roam the earth at night um, because sunlight tends to be a weakness in all different forms. I mean, if you're talking vampire diaries, you gotta get a daylight ring. If you're talking twilight, you sparkle in the sun. So mainly they're known to roam at night or in dark places and drink the blood of humans and and basically drain them dry. It is thought that Bram Stoker, the man that created the well-known Count Dracula, had basically gotten his entire inspiration off of a man that was called Vlad the Impaler. Now Vlad the Impaler was born in Transylvania, Romania, and he ruled Wallachia and Romania on and off from roughly 1456 to 1462. Now when you look within history, there are some notes of him being a just man, but 
also always backed with him being very cruel. He got his name, Vlad the Impaler, because his favorite way to kill his enemies was to impale them on a wooden stake and allow them to die that way. Which again, now we see how that basically formed into vampire folklore, as vampires being killed by a wooden stake through the heart. Now it is said, or rumored, or folklore, if you will, that Vlad Dracula would then use the blood of his victims to dip his bread as he ate dinner in front of their dead bodies. So when diseases and things started to plague towns, specifically in the Middle Ages, the vampire superstition again became very popular. There was a specific plague that created bleeding mouth lesions on people's bodies, and to uneducated people, the entire myth or storyline started to form that it was vampires that were coming and killing large amounts of people in towns. It also wasn't un common for someone who was showing any signs of physical or mental distress in certain ways to also be labeled as vampires, or anyone with certain diseases to be labeled as vampires. For instance, there is this disease that was known as porphyria, which would cause blood blisters if you went out into the sunlight, so your skin would start to blister and it would look almost like, like in vampire movies now, where vampires start to burn up like they can't be underneath the sun. The other really interesting thing is that this same disease, some of the symptoms of that disease can be alleviated by drinking blood. So so again, you take those facts and you can see how the common vampire folklore really started to form. That said though, other diseases, just as commonly as rabies, like if, you, if somebody had that, that would be another indication, another example of people being said to be vampires that were actually just having a normal human reaction to, to types of diseases. You were still a person that could die, like you weren't Oh, the living dead. Now when suspected vampires back in the day would die, their bodies would be searched for different clues of vampirism. Like they, they would actually go inside and try and see if there was any signs of this actually being a thing. And a lot of the times when they would do these tests and this research, they would do so with a stake through the heart of the human body just in case it actually was a vampire and they would come back to life. And then in other areas, there's also notes in history of bodies being decapitated or burned so that again, if they were vampires, suspected vampires, they would do these things in order to make sure that this person wasn't a vampire, couldn't come back to life. You speed forward to today and, and modern day science has clearly proven that vampirism isn't a real thing, but there actually are still people that you might say like practice vampirism or call themselves vampires that live in today's world. They're basically these communities of self-identified vampires, either online, there's also towns, communities, and groups and clubs that you can join that are again self-identified vampires that drink blood of willing donors, people that are willing to donate their blood to these groups. Now these can often be normal seeming, and I use normal in a weird, you know, there's no such thing as normal, but they can be like people that you wouldn't necessarily suspect that drink small amounts of blood in order to, and again, this is like, you don't know if this is actually true information or not, but I feel like it's like maybe misled information that drinking blood can have some health benefits. Most people that do, and if they do practice vampirism in the modern day, do so in private because of obviously, I mean, it's not a common thing, so I think a lot of people are probably, they just don't want to be bothered with judgment, they tend to keep to themselves, specifically within these groups. I remember watching a Jerry Springer episode, like way back in high school, about a guy who had was a self-identified vampire, and thinking that that was like an interesting thing, but I'd never thought of it until I was researching for today's Coffee Talk again, and I didn't realize that there were full-on communities of people that are still, or that, that call themselves vampires, even knowing, like I said, that modern day science has proven that this isn't a thing. Another interesting thing, because I feel like I've experienced this myself and, and I've heard the term energy vampire before, but there are also self-identified vampires. They don't actually drink the blood of any humans or anything like that, but they, they focus on energy. So they are self-identified energy vampires. Vampires ended up becoming super mainstream after Dracula was published. And then, you know, you lead into, I guess, kind of like the 2000s, people like Stephanie Meyer who have a dream in the middle of the night of a Dracula-like type beautiful man being obsessed with a Bella-like swan, or an Elena who was in love with a Stefan and a Damon, with a doppelganger who was once 
feeling the same type of way. Now, I know we can't dip into Halloween chats without talking about ghosts, but trying to find the history on ghosts is really complicated because I feel like ghosts have been around probably just as long as humans have been, really, if you want to go that far. And there's so much different routes you can take with the whole ghost thing. But basically, since ancient times, ghost stories and tales of spirits have been shared written, documented, and all of the above. Now, a great deal of, I guess, some of the more famous threads of ghost history usually include a lot of the old Roman rulers, emperors, kings, queens, politicians, famous writers, and many people that were well-known or popular that basically died any type of mysterious or violent or sudden death. So the concept of a ghost is based on like the ancient belief that our spirits are inside or a part of our bodies, but not our actual bodies. So when our bodies stop working, that our spirits then separate or leave our bodies, and that that energy can remain or stay trapped here in Earth's dimension, if you will. So it's actually because of this that many people began doing funeral rituals whenever somebody passed away in order to really put the spirit at rest. There's documented sightings of full-on armies and battles that are going on in old historic battlefields that aren't act that weren't actually happening. It was like a literal sighting of many ghosts at once, but then you also can get really historical old buildings that are said to be haunted and it's basically believed that haunted places or haunted battlefields things like that. It's usually places where something very again violent or something very high energy usually on the negative side happened and it's like that energy gets trapped there now of course with haunted houses there's sights or seeings of actual people but haunted houses are also associated with like things levitating on their own fires starting on their own um strange weird noises doors slamming and shutting all of the paranormal activity that you could think of also fun fact that i want to make note of while i was doing my research for today's coffee talk and I was researching this exact part. I'm in the part of my notes right now while I'm going through our chat today where I wrote in capital letters like my ears just started ringing like crazy. So as I got into this whole ghost world all of a sudden my ears started ringing really loud which I thought was just super weird because again if you're superstitious at all that is said that is said to be like a sign of you know, an energetic shift in the air. So I just thought it was really weird. I mean, again, I don't really know if I believe in ghosts. I actually would probably say I lean more towards believing solely because I've had my own weird experiences with ghosts and I've posted story times on that. Actually, I think the very first Utober I ever did, there was a full ghost story time about this ghost that was sticking around me and my friend Maggie when we lived in this really old house from the 1800s back in my hometown. And if you guys want to watch that, you can hear all of the creepy things that you to happen. Even still, I wouldn't say that I necessarily am haunted and I don't think that ghost or that energy is around me anymore, if that's what that was. Uh, but there are definitely times and I think that, uh, I don't, I'm just, I don't know, I think that sometimes when you are very sensitive and intuitive that you can pick up on things and sometimes there will be weird things that happen. Things that I think I'll see, things like my Xbox turning on on its own all of the time or just like weird shifts in the air that make me get that bodily feeling of like goosebumps or just something and I, I'll like sense it but then I also have this part of my brain that instantly wants to cap that part of me and is like no you're just being crazy. So I would say I lean more towards believing, but I also have that logical sense of I don't know if I would believe that either because I also don't think that we stay here when we die. I I don't know, it begs, you have to bring a lot of things into question when you start wondering about whether or not ghosts could be real. On the topic of good quality ingredients, California crafted since 2013 Forager Project is an organic, plant-based, family-owned, and operated food company creating innovative, delicious, tasting products sourced from nature's finest ingredients – nuts, seeds, ancient grains, fruits, and vegetables. Crafted by fellow foragers and its own unique purpose-built creamery, the only 100% organic, plant-based facility of its kind, Forager's Project's family of foods includes totally organic, 100% vegan yogurts, nut milks, sour creams, kefirs, shakes, and butter. So all of you guys that are 
fellow plant basters out there that sounded weird basters but you know what i mean this is definitely gonna be right up your alley plus a really cool thing for those of you guys that are from the united states forager announced its commitment to help cultivate democracy so during the next month forager project will be shifting packaging on its yogurts kefirs and milks to encourage consumers nationwide to get involved and vote this november and they're launching a broader effort with organic and paid advertising to encourage everyone in the u.s to vote this november 3rd some other quick and cool facts is that they're family owned 100 percent organic based in California and dedicated to making the world a better place than they found it. They use their hero ingredient, organic cashews, for the creamiest base in all of their products. And like I mentioned, they want to inspire everyone to get out there and vote and participate in the U.S. democracy. They've provided voting resources and information for anyone listening in the United States at www.foragerproject.com vote and on their socials at Forager Project. So as I believe I mentioned a little bit earlier, I'm sure we all know that we're dipping into the chillier seasons of the year. Fall and winter tend to be when I get more introspective, you know, spend more time at home, although we've all spent a lot of time at home this year. But just in general, I feel like I like to learn new things, get into new hobbies, you know, sharpen some new skills. And it's usually the time that I dip further into things like Skillshare. I'm sure you guys have heard of Skillshare before because it's widely popular, but just in case you don't, Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people where you can explore new skills, you can deepen your existing passions, or just get lost into some creativity, which I feel like is so needed right now. So something I got just before moving away from Toronto was an iPad. It was something that I've been wanting to get into for a long time, but I specifically got it because I wanted to start working on more digital art art moving into the fall and winter time and to keep my mind busy knowing that I was entering a stressful season. The thing is though, I mean, I had the iPad, but I didn't know exactly how to start making art or to even draw on it. So there's one class in particular, it's called iPad Illustration, Draw a Digital Coloring Page, taught by Robert Jenner at the third. And it's incredible. I mean, his skill level is a whole a whole other ballpark game that I'm playing in, but I still learned a lot. And that's just like the tip of the iceberg. There's still so many different classes I can literally learn just on things to do on my iPad, art or not. And outside of even just an iPad, there's things from mastering illustration with a literal pen and pencil, you know, going back to the old school ways. They also have things on music, film and video, creative writing. I've even used Skillshare back when I was writing the first book of Catcher and how to create a character art and so many different things. Skillshare offers membership with meaning with so much to explore, real projects to create and the support of fellow creatives online Skillshare empowers you to accomplish real growth with your goals and also a community of people that are there learning with you. The best part about Skillshare is that their classes fit your schedule and your skill level. You get to choose your classes when you do them and members get unlimited access to thousands of inspiring classes with hands-on projects and feedback from a community of millions. So if you want to explore your creativity, check out Skillshare.com slash talk. And the first 1000 people to use that link will get a free trial of the Skillshare premium membership. So to receive free access to thousands of classes for free for a limited time, then go over to Skillshare.com slash talk and the first thousand to do so will be able to give their premium membership a try. So next I want to talk about good old Satan. Let's jump into the devil folklore, shall we? Because I mean, all I got, okay, the only thing I can think of now is how every single like Netflix, I guess like supernatural show has taken the devil spin and, and Vampire Diaries did it too. But I, last year I watched the third season, I think it was, or whatever the most recent season of Sabrina the Teenage Witch is on Netflix. And they just went like a whole new route with the whole like devil and Satan thing. And then there's this show called Lucifer on Netflix that I tried to get into and I, I failed, but I just feel like that's another common tale you see of Lucifer, or Satan, and I wanted to know the history of all of that, knowing that it would probably lead me into, I guess, like kind of Christianity and the Bible, but then again, that's all I've ever known because that's all I was ever taught. So let's talk about the devil's folklore. So the devil or Satan is obviously most commonly known as the embodiment of evil and normally the opposite of God or faith or anything like that. Now the devil himself, it's been said or called by many different names, like we 
we said Satan, Lucifer. Um, it's a part of many different religions, though it's all believed kind of separately. And over the years, the story of Satan and the devil has basically compounded and, and grown upon itself to include things like physical appearances of having horns and a devil's tail, um, of being an amazingly handsome man, which is my favorite version of the devil, if you ask me. But to this day, there are still all walks of life that have a still like a still instilled fear of the devil. And again, I believe I could say I could say I believe that in the sense of I I don't have a fear of the devil because I I don't really I don't want to like actively attach to any kind of fear. Um, but I will say that I'm like anti evil, and I feel like the devil or Satan, and, and we're about to get into this, but I basically feel like he's just the embodiment, like the human embodiment of evil, and humans humans have done this for so long in history, including like with mythological creatures and things like that, but we tend to personify things that we don't understand, and I feel like us creating things like the devil or Satan were us personifying evil and things that we just couldn't understand. Just like we personified God as if he was like, like humans were created in God's image. Like, I don't know if I actually believe that. I don't think God's a human. I think we're just, we need to almost personify things in order to get our, our heads around it. Within the Bible, you know, it was said that it was the devil that basically lured Eve into eating the forbidden fruit that caused Adam and Eve to be sent to live as mortal humans. And then there's also the common belief that Lucifer or Satan or the devil used to be an angel and an angel of God at that who had fallen. But most other religions also attest to a creature that roams the earth that is the embodiment of evil. Just basically is the destroyer of all things good. In Islam, for instance, the devil is known as Satan and he is also said to be basically the protagonist to God. Now in Judaism, Satan is a verb. It's not an actual person or thing. And it usually, like the, in terms of said verb, it usually pertains to any kind of lust or temptation, uh, kind of like that whole symbolism behind Eve eating the apple, but in a different way, like any kind of hardship or, or anything that tests you that you need to overcome. In Buddhism, it was Mara or Mara. Um, there's two A's in there. But Mara was the demon that lured or tempted the Buddha away and distracted him from his journey to enlightenment. But just like in things like Judaism and Christianity, Buddha resisted the urge and resisted the temptation of this evil spirit and conquered it. Now, one of the biggest connections with the devil tends to be with hell. And it's the idea that, well, there's the common idea that Satan or the devil is the ruler of hell, but this actually was kind of, I feel like, twisted in folklore in a way. In the Bible, it was it was attested to that he would be banished to hell, but not to rule hell. And so I don't know where that kind of came along the way, but I feel like, again, with that personification of evil and hell being kind of like the place of evil, maybe it just made sense that he would be the ruler. There was a poem called The Divine Comedy that became extremely popular in the 14th century that also alluded to the idea that Satan was the ruler of hell. So that could also be where that idea came to be, or started to popularize. In this poem, it was believed that God created hell when he banished Satan and all of his evil demons, and that cre it created this hole in the center of the earth where hell be came to be, and that's where Satan and his demons went, and that's where this poem basically creates this storyline that the devil rules hell and that God rules heaven. Now, while the Bible actually doesn't really talk about what the devil looks like, by about the Middle Ages, it had come to be very common to think of Satan or the devil as a man with horns, a tail, a pitchfork, to be burning red, or to be a just gorgeously dark, tall, dark, and handsome man uh, with evil eyes, but and also maybe possibly horns and like the pitchfork. It's said that the religious translations of things like eat the devil and Satan are, you know, controversial because you're getting into controversial topics there when you bring up anything to do that are, that it lies so heavily within the tapestry of life and like what it 
why we exist, what the duality of light and darkness is, like, does that come into play with the whole heaven and hell? Do, do those places exist? Are they just, like I said, kind of like personified stories or landscapes or people that we've created to try and understand things that are really hard for our brains to grasp, even though our bodies tend to kind of feel it, you know? Um, I'm getting a little cosmic-y right now, but regardless of any of the controversy, it is definitely a common thread throughout all of the writings that the devil is an evil person or an evil doer. And to this day, many Christians actually still believe that he's transformed the earth to where it is today, that that's why there's so many terrible things that tend to be happening. But just again, to, to look at all sides of the pancake, the Church of Satan, which the people within the Church of Satan are known as Satanists. They're known to not worship the devil, but to celebrate him as a symbol of temptation, of challenge, of atheism, and pride, and liberty, and challenge, and temptation, and I guess kind of just like the opposite side of that spectrum of the human experience of joy, and faith, and good, and light, and all of that. Now that said, there, we have to, if we're talking about the history, we got to put it all out there. There's also groups that are Satanists, that are worshippers of evil. And it's, again, I guess it's like, I don't know if I've just been naive or what, but it's always when I go to do research for coffee talks that I find out facts that I'm like, no, but it's true. There's groups out there that worship the devil as a deity, as if he's a, an actual god. And they'll often perform like satanic rituals and, or make like satanic pacts, also known as deals with the devil. The cool thing about Halloween is that I've always loved the idea of it being that kind of embrace of the things that scare us, you know, like you willingly watch scary movies to spook yourself out. We willingly embrace these creatures, these ideas of things that we've kind of shunned away from or feared ourselves away from in human history, specifically with like ghosts and witches. And of course it's created or been, uh, I don't want to say branded because I feel like that's such a 2020 way to explain Halloween, but I do feel like a lot of these things have been so deeply entwined with things like Halloween that it's easy to kind of forget where these common creatures or myths or story or folklores come from. So looking into the human history of a lot of these things and actually finding out how deeply entrenched they are in things like human history and human religion and just how we even, how it all came to be what it is today is so beyond interesting to me because it doesn't just put me in the Halloween mood. I also always feel like I learned something new. We need to know where we come from to understand how we got here. So there you have it. That is just a very small scale version of some of the history within a lot of the Halloween folklore and a lot of the Halloween creatures and things that we know to be a part of Halloween today. I hope it put you in the Halloween mood. There were a couple others I wanted to include in here, like werewolves and zombies and things like that, but we would have just been sitting here talking folklore forever, which would have been a mood, but you know, I'm sure you guys have other things that you want to do. And we have other Utober videos to get to 2016. So if you type Utober into the YouTube search engine, you will likely find a lot of my Halloween fall content. So feel free to come take a dive. And aside from that, in terms of coffee talks, I will talk to all of you guys in November crazy thing to think about. Um, in terms of Utober journeyers, then I will talk to all of you guys tomorrow. Bye guys.